uh, well, before we dive into all of the presentations and speaking, I just want to give a special thanks and shout out to uh, Maureen and Rob, Agency 29, and Skull and Diamond Park Capital. Uh, they made all of the, the food and everything else here tonight possible, so can't thank them enough. <laughs> The commissary who helped put me in touch with uh, Dylan Tool, uh, Easy Eats Rock, uh, did an incredible job on the catering. So I hope you all enjoy the food. Uh, if you ever need a caterer, contact Dylan Tool. His business cards are on the table. So take those cards and reach out to him. Uh, other than that, Sarah.
Those 20 finalist teams then advance to our business development phase, which is pretty much an accelerator program. And they work one-on-one -on -one with our affiliated mentors, some of them are here tonight, uh, to help them um, acclimate to the Grow New York region and New York State as a broad. broad. Uh, it's a global competition, so some of these teams have never been to New York, and others are local and very familiar, but need uh, facilitated introductions to some key potential partners. They're looking to uh, build relationships with maybe manufacturers, distributors, co-packers, or uh, have introductions to grocery stores, or um, maybe even uh, following up with tours of farms and potential customers in that way. So they come to the region, we offer a stipend for them to visit for three days, uh, two nights, throughout their 10 week business development phase. Uh, and that's more for the face-to-face -face boots on the ground, get a sense of place uh, while they're here. And then ultimately those mentors are preparing and helping advise the teams formulate their pitch. Uh, the pitch itself takes place during the summit. This year it's in Ithaca uh, on November 6th and 7th. And they give a 10 minute pitch with 10 minutes of questions in front of a seven panel judge. Those judges select seven winning teams. There's a million dollar top prize, two $500,000 and four $250,000 prize levels. And these are stru structured as equity investments uh, based through uh, milestone agreements. So every team uh, sets different milestones related to what they pitch as to their impact they're wanting to make in the region. And ultimately they work on those milestones and receive tranches of that prize money throughout the year following winning. And then they all ultimately become ambassadors, very much like Paul is tonight, to give a sampling and a wonderful representation of what uh, the experience of a winning team is like and what a pitch looks like and sounds like. Uh, his energy and enthusiasm is contagious, and I'm hoping that you find it very inspiring. So I'm going to, uh, will advance. This is uh, the website I re referenced. Uh, this is the email you can reach out to if you get the QR code. That's my name, and I'll be around afterwards for networking. But following you. All right. Good. All right. So I think there's one of two ways this can go. It's I'm going to take requests. Okay. I can either do this, try and do this exactly the way I did it on that stage that day, or I could do like the director's commentary version where I talk about like what we were thinking and why we did what we did. What do you think? <laughs> Is that number Okay, okay. Oh. All right. So, <laughs> well, you have 45 minutes? No. <laughs> okay, so um, in 2021, which was the year before we got to go to Grow New York, uh, Genesee County reached out to me and they're like, hey, we have this kiosk at Grow New York. You should. Hey, Jen. I heard you went well, right? ADHD. Um, Genesee County reached out and they were like, we have this kiosk at Grow New York. Would you like to come and be at our kiosk? And I went, and and the traffic kind of died down of the like trade show portion because they were doing this pitch competition in the other room. So there's nobody at my booth, and so I just kind of wandered in there and sat there and watched these pitches. And every single one of the entrepreneurs on that stage was just the smartest person I've ever heard. And the idea was the best idea I've ever heard. And every single one of them, I was just like, well, they won. And then the next one, I'm like, well, they won. And then the next one said, they won. But what came up like seven times was that they all had a hard time finding manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is, you know, like the one thing I could do if I got up on that stage is I could say like, hey, the last seven pitches could all be my clients, you know? And I thought that was like a nice little, it was the first kind of glimmer of light, but I can't talk like that. Like I can't talk smart. So I didn't know, <laughs> but, like how was I gonna do? So we had to create something which, which I wrote down I did notes today, and I was hoping you guys would say the director's commentary version, because I wrote down some stuff, and the very first time I ever went through this pitch, I was trying so hard to sound like an entrepreneur. I was like, I was using words I didn't even know what they mean. Like, I, you know, like, I had to Google what a cap table was, runway, like, I didn't know what I was talking about. And we went on a walk, and I started to do the pitch to my wife, and she was like, terrible, you sound, you sound like a robot, like what are you doing? 
And um, so then, the, like a couple days later, my son got sick. I had to come home during the day, and I sat in bed, and I wrote it like I would tell it to my friend. Like if I was sitting across from my buddy having a beer, and he said, tell me about craft cannery, I just wrote, opened up a Microsoft Word document, started just word vomiting what I would say, well, well, this is what we do. And so that's what the pitch actually became. The very first slide deck that I ever created, there's not a hint of it in here. It was so bad, so bad. I'm here to tell you there's hope. Okay, the only slide I altered at all was this first one. So the original pitch was, it, the original deck was different. This is actually just from a, uh, last week, from our groundbreaking on our, uh, what the New York made happen. Thank you very much. The, uh, the picture was different. It was a picture of all our employees. But the strategic thing about this slide was to show competency because one of the, the rubric is customer value, innovation, team, job creation, growth potential, and viability slash commercialization. So this needed to show that we actually are doing what we say we're doing, we're competent. USDA has come to our plant and said, yep, stamp of approval, they know what they're doing. And I was able to get this slide in like 15 seconds, was the other point, because it's just visual and it wasn't like me going, and we do FDA, and we do USDA. The SQF was also kind of a mind-blowing thing. I won't go too far into exactly what that means, but it's sort of a third-party audit. It's kind of a bigger deal for food manufacturers, and I knew by putting that on there that it would immediately just establish that we had the competence, that we knew what we were doing. So the next thing was, um, I thought it was a big advantage that we're based here, right? If we were like a home team. So I wanted it to look, I'm oh, sorry, that one was bad. So I wanted it to look like, I wanted them to see this map and see, our, we're already doing this in the Grow New York region. So it was sort of like a, almost a, we're not saying we're gonna do it, because I heard a lot of that too, a lot of promising what we're gonna do. It was a, we're already doing it. Help us get better, accelerate, as you said. And so the whole, like this line that we had come up with here was, I was gonna say, these are the brands we work with. And um, I should have gotten rid of the real leaf. That's a source of. These are the brands we work with, but then the line was something, it was good in the moment. I wish I could remember, but it was something like, but these are the faces behind the brands. These are the entrepreneurs. These are the actual people behind those brands. And then it was. Um, we have, you know, fifth generation, we have immigrants, we have uh, husband and wife teams, mother-daughter teams, um, you know, side hustle people, retired police officers. Like, I wanted to show that this was, there were real souls, real humans behind what we were doing. So this was to get the, what's the actual customer proposition? And uh, this was a place where I kept on taking too much time. So I really, if I fumbled at all in the pitch, it was here because I was rushing. I was trying so hard to get through this. But it was, who's your target customer? And the target customer was startup entrepreneurs, somebody who just can't find a co-packer. And I said something really important at this part on accident. And I said, we don't have minimums. I said, no minimums. Now, one of the pieces of the rubric is innovation. And my backup slides were all innovation because we were positive that they were gonna say, you're not innovative, you're just making sauce. What's innovative about that? We were positive. They didn't ask us a single question about innovation and I was puzzled. Later, when we actually did our, uh, later like we got our feedback, um, I asked about that. I asked about like innovate, what, how did we, how did we do on innovation? And they were like, oh, flying colors. And I was like, how, were, how did we get flying colors on innovation? And the answer was no minimums. The fact that we actually said that. You've never heard a co-packer say no minimums, right? And isn't that like the worst thing? You've never heard a co-packer say no minimums. It's impossible. It doesn't exist, right? And so that was immediate check mark for innovation. So that was a little bit lucky, to tell you the truth, because I didn't see that coming. I thought for sure we were going to get hit on what do you do that's innovative. We talked about restaurants and food packaging, and then we talked about regional clients, and another big deal here was this was the first time that Wegmans ever gave us permission to say that we were co-packing for them. Because there's confidentiality involved in that, and that can be really tricky about who do you co-pack for. And so it was hard, I had to really approach every single one of those logos and faces you saw and get permission to say that. And I mean, I think everybody in the room probably knows, and I don't mean to like over-explain, but the idea is, 
it's not a good look for us to say we made such and such as sauce because we don't. They made it. That's their thing, right? You get it, right? You're working with a co-packer. Like I could never say we make Sadie's relish. We don't, by the way. But I could never make. We, that's not fair to you. It's not fair to the client to say we make that product. So it's just a murky thing. But Wegmans gave us permission for this pitch, and it, it was the beginning of an amazing. Because that's just the resume builder that you need when you start your career. And they said, yep, put us on your resume. And that was just huge. So at this point, it was, you know, back to the competency. It was, let's prove that we're actually competent and that we know what we're talking about. And so I went back and I told this story of how I actually started, because I didn't start as a co-packer. I started as just a guy with a sauce, just kind of hustling and going around town and cold calling. And I had to go through this, this period of time of trying to find a co-packer. And it was impossible. The first phone call I ever made was Ledestri. They very professionally laughed me off the phone. In a prof it was professional, but they did. They very professionally kind of said, you know, hey kid, try, you know, try renting a kitchen for a night. You know, it was it was very, very difficult to get anyone to take you seriously. And I did end up finding somebody. There was this guy, Coach Tony, who was making like a Rochester style garbage plate meat sauce. So he had bought a couple of kettles and got a HACCP plan, and he had this little operation going, and he was willing to do 40 gallon batches. And so I ended up finding him, and I just always thought that that was brilliant. But so I told the story of hustling around the county, uh, the county the state really, and trying to launch this sauce, and eventually launching. Commissary didn't exist at the time. If it had, that would have been amazing, but it didn't, and so there was, so I talked about how when we launched this product, I had to, I had to, do all these things. I had to figure this whole thing out, do a million different things in order just to get that on the shelf. And the other thing I did is I put my cell phone number on the jar, which is still on the jar to this day. You go to like my cell phone number is still on that jar. And I was on the radio. My previous career was media. And every once in a while, this would come up. So all those things combined meant people were constantly calling me and asking me questions. Restaurant owners, aspiring entrepreneurs, just people constantly were calling me to ask me about uh, how do I this, what do I that? And I realized I was giving away years worth of knowledge that I had gotten myself for free in a 10 minute phone call. And I started thinking for a couple years before I did it, I started going like, this might actually be the idea. Because the sauce was going fine, but the sauce was just going fine. Maybe plateauing, right? Like Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and beyond that, I didn't have the resources really to grow it beyond that. And so it was like, what's gonna come next? And I started to realize that helping other people get started was really valuable information. This information that I had acquired. So Accelerate, you had said it's like an accelerator. We were onto that. When we were going through Grow New York, we knew that we were kind of in an accelerator program. It really felt like that. And so again, this is us begging them, begging the judges to think we're innovative when I had already gotten two slides ago and not even realized it. But this was me going around and finding all these different things that we do that are so innovative. And I just, I wish I knew I wasted so much time on this slide <laughs> just trying to say, we're innovative, we're innovative, we're innovative. And they're like, we already got you, bro. We know. <laughs> uh, so we gave a couple of specific stories. And then this, okay, so this was a really big deal. So at the time, this is late 2022, we had just crossed the $2 million mark. This is like November of 2022. And we got to go 15th or 16th out of 20. And the one thing I kept noticing was that nobody had any significant sales. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that we changed the night before the pitch was the closest thing was Sweet Pea, actually, Holly, who had like two million in total sales. We had two million on the year already. And so what me and my partner kept on nudging each other through all the pitches was, we have better numbers than everybody. And you know, this is a big deal. So the only thing we added in the moment was this line that like worked and it was, and I rehearsed it in my hotel like 10 times that morning. So when we got to this slide, I said, we uh, we have done $2 million, we are prop and we are profitable. Sorry, I rehearsed it, let me try again. <laughs> we are a $2 million company this year and we are profitable right now. And then I just paused for like five seconds, like just long enough to let it, and that Oh, I'm sorry. Doesn't my yeah. <laughs> Not okay. I was told, right? I was told two F bombs and three community. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, so I noticed that, and I really think that that was a thing for us. 
was the fact that we actually had real numbers. We were profitable, we had real sales at that, at that time. Um, so this is another, so another thing, Cornell is behind this whole thing, right? And Ed and everybody at Cornell had used this word, it's the Death Valley of co-packers. There's nothing in between the small and the big, and isn't there room in here for somebody to just pick a spot and settle down and be just one step behind the death street? And so again on stage I said, according to Cornell University, <laughs> there is a Death Valley of co-packers. So I was basically saying, you guys told us that we need to exist, so give us money, right? Like it was, it was, it worked, it just, it worked. I did it a little smoother than that. That sounded dangerous. Um, so, okay, so team. So uh, needed to show competency of the team and needed to show that we had mentors, people that we could reach up to and talk to. And over the years, I did, now Bruno's the process authority, everybody knows Bruno, but I asked Bruno, can we list you as here? Because technically he was advising us, he, but he advises everybody. Aaron Tolfrey has been a freaking dream come true. Aaron Tolfrey, like when we broke, I mean Aaron Tolfrey runs a, a hundreds and hundreds of million dollar business in Baldwin Richardson Foods. And when we did our groundbreaking last week, wrote me a, a abnormally long email of congratulations. I mean, like she is the person that should be up here talking right now. She she's fantastic. Frank Cavallaro, I think, is also probably a celebrity in this room and needs no introduction, right? And then at the time, Stephanie Ledestri, who has since moved and I honestly haven't really talked to in a while, but at that time, she was very open and forthcoming and said, come to our plant, you know, ask every question you can. Put me with a couple of her people. And so I really felt like by putting that name on there and that name on there that we were showing that we're doing it, but also when we have a question, we're getting the answers from the right sources, right? Uh, and then this was a thing about, this was a big debate about like, do we just say we want the million dollars? And in fact, some shit that we took in the questions was, I just skipped all this. I didn't even talk about this. I just said, with your $1 million, we will, blah, blah, blah. And one of the judges said, you didn't even say 250 or 500, so why would we give you that? You know, and I was like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't do good at that one. Um, and then, yes, and then, you know, this was the closing slide. Oh, yes, yeah, a little graphic, very nice. Yeah. Okay. And then check this out, just because I, I, what I was telling you, right? All the backup slides were, well, I guess there was money in there, I'm sorry, but it was it was so much about innovation. <laughs> it was all about innovation. So, so, all right. Advice. May I get some advice? Okay. The first one is going to sound really corny, but I mean this from the bottom of my heart, and I will elaborate. Because when I say it, you're all going to go, oh, really? I came here for this? Be yourself. Now, hold on a second. I know that this sounds like we're in a motivational speaker right now. But I was standing on that stage. <clears throat> I heard a lot of the entrepreneurs were not being themselves. There was a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of, hello, bro, New York. How is everyone doing today? We're doing great. Isn't this so wonderful? And I'm going, robots. Like, you know, like, there's a, there's a, this is what I meant when I said, can I talk with some, yeah, you know, I got with some. That. <laughs> you know, or there was like, there was just like a lot of, like there were people who clearly had been coached to like have energy, but they weren't naturally energetic. And so they're trying really hard to have energy. And it just makes everything come off, you know, not so genuine. And um, I don't talk with big words. I say, um, at one time, I remember one of the coaches was like, never reference the slide. And like three times in the pitch, I was like, look at this, you know. <laughs> but that's like speech giving 101, like don't, don't do that. Don't say look at this. But it was just who I am, and that's how I would have told it to Tom if we were sitting there having a beer, you know. And so the be yourself thing, I got up there, I spoke in my language like I was talking to my friends, and I really feel like that worked. Because I, I was comfortable. I was just comfortable. Nothing made me nervous about being up there. Uh, because I knew that I wasn't going to go into anything that I couldn't just naturally go into over a beer with a buddy. Um, the rubric, the next piece of advice is, is those, it's just designed directly to the rubric. When you make your pitch, just take the rubric and make sure that you hit the rubric. Every thing, single thing should be what's on the rubric. Um, practice with real questions. So I did a bunch of this too. I got myself in front of some really savvy business people and I said, can I do my pitch? And can you fire questions at me? And that really worked. And in fact, 
saved us because one of the questions we got was a, was a, actually one that you didn't get to see because I changed that picture. But the picture was we were a bunch of white guys. And so where's your diversity? And I had been asked that question in prep. Uh, I went to Dixon Schwabel where my wife worked and um, got to workshop it for like their entire management team and said, where's your, they said, we get that, we get that. So you need to be ready to answer that. Where's your diversity? And so we could I'd come up with an answer, a true answer, which was we're in Bergen, New York. This is who applies for jobs. This is who applies. But if you looked at the entrepreneurs we're working with, you saw a ton of diversity, right? But as far as who's actually coming to work for $20 an hour in Bergen, New York, it is white guys. I hate to say it, but that's who we're getting. But the, the who we're working with, um, the, I put have sales. That's easy, right? Have sales. <laughs> Just have sales. But, uh, but that was clearly, I really think a big moment for us was if, if you got some sales for sure, there was a lot of pre-revenue. And the other thing was there's that, like that, you know, that thing that every entrepreneur has, which is the, well, we're not doing any sales right now, but we're going to do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, that one. I was like, let's, let's steer clear of the, you know, the sort of the fake, like we're going to do. I know we only did $73,000 last year, but in just two years, we will be a $73 million company. <laughs> and like, I'm always going, eh, all right. Um, Charisma is competent is competence and a calming energy, which I don't really have. But, um, bring some energy, and then um, the last thing I had put I already told you guys about innovation, but the last thing I said was what we did right was we had that really innovative piece about that we did no minimums, we didn't even know we had it. What we did wrong, because of course when it came to the the finding out <coughs> the judging, I'm competitive, and so I wanted to know why we didn't. And I'm very grateful, and I love that we, you know, obviously so, so grateful for what Bernie York did. But I was wondering what stopped us from coming in the first place. And what we were told was that we didn't have enough intellectual property. We were a very safe, just very like, yes, we believe you will grow and we believe you will be safe. But when you try to sell this business, you're going to sell for like 2x. And we're looking for somebody that's going to sell for 30x, right? And so that was so we did, so what we did is we actually took that feedback and we spun off a, another business called Crackinery Brands, which owns now Guglielmo's and Salsa Cuse and a few other brands that we've kind of slowly acquired or created over time. Um, so anyway, yeah, was that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Partially, we, we let that run longer because that was amazing. Uh, we're we're going to do a quick round of questions, Q&A, and I know that we could probably ask questions for an hour, so we're going to limit this to Two five minutes max, and then we're going to go into our actual pitches. So, uh, and just as a heads up for those pitches, we're going to be 10 minutes on the clock and five minutes Q&A. I am so freaking happy that you guys didn't make me actually do that pitch because I don't think I would have remembered. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh my God, here she is. <laughs> That's the pro mode. Uh, can you? You just mentioned in passing, but I think it's an important thing. You just mentioned you spun off another company that is incubating brands that you are creating. Yeah. Can you talk about how you identify where there is room to launch a new product that has room to be able to scale? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, Good, I don't know that we figured that out completely yet. But so first was the obvious, just bring Google almost in and make it you know, part of the team. Because for a while it was dirty. It was not dirty, but it was weird. It was like a separate thing. So it was bring Google almost in. And then what was happening was some of our clients were building nice little brands and then they would just like lose interest. They'd get into like Wegmans and lose interest. And I'd be like, well, you know, let me take over your brand, you know? What do you want for it? And then I would I would say, well, how about if we make your sauce for free, like next two runs for free? You know, you want ten thousand dollars for your brand? Okay, we'll do your next two runs for free, and then we own your brand. And like we've done that a couple times. And so we're just like accumulating brands, and I got plenty of seeds planted too. Then we created the brand Slow, which kind of isn't what because you, you're asking about scalability. The one that has really risen to the top has been the Rochester style meat sauce, which is not scalable because it's specific to Rochester, but. I just went to summer festivals all year last year and just 
had people sample it, and that was the cream that rose to the top. I think that's what they said about the Philly cheese thing. That's true. That's true, right? Or Charleston cheese. <laughs> okay. Any other news? Sorry, Dustin. No. Yes, sir. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, um, All the smart part of Grove, New York. Why don't you just quickly explain the metro? Uh, Dude, Mazdi like, did nothing. It was all me. <laughs> uh, no, the, the mentor, it's, he, she mentioned it's like you're in an accelerator. We got this guy, Eric Mazdi, who worked for Corning. I mean, this, this he was an engineer. Like, this guy was the smartest person I've ever been around in my life. And all of a sudden, he's just with us. And we got him for hours and hours and hours. And his wisdom was, uh, again, we don't do this without it. And I remember exactly, my, my partner, Tom Riggio, who was there and on stage with me, I remember when we won, we said, we need to send some gifts to people, like Aaron and Stephanie and everybody, we need to send some gifts. And I said, what do we get Eric? And he goes, the budget is very high for Eric. <laughs> because of the role that the mentors play. I mean, the mentors are just, they're your teammate, and they're not just, they're not just like calling you twice and going, how's it going? They're saying, I'm in here, let's do the work together. Eric was working on our PowerPoint with us. Like he would work on a slide and then, and then show me, what do you think of this? I did this, it would be a thousand times better, you know? How many mentors do we have in the room here? There's a couple. Yeah. <laughs> and then else? So I have a question. I love working with like new startups and I do find in the super early stage that they're intimidated about calling co-packers. So if somebody's cold calling you for a relationship, what kind of questions do you want them to have prepared? What do you want to ask them? And yeah. Tricks? Uh, so everybody, the first thing they always ask you is, what's it going to cost? Which is, a, to be honest with you, is a little annoying because I'm always, I don't even know your recipe yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your special things are, so that's not a great answer. But typically, I want to see somebody that's got skin in the game and and isn't just thinking it's a get rich quick scheme. There's some of that too. So people, and I'm like, I got news for you if you think this is a get rich quick scheme, <laughs> right? Like. Um, but you want to see somebody who's sitting across the table from you, holding on to their recipe and their brand and not wanting to give it, to slide it across the table, as opposed to the person who's sitting there going, take it all, how much money do I make? Yeah. Right? Like that. You just want to see that person so close to their heart that they're going to do everything. Like this girl, Jax, right here. This girl started uh, the cashew butter, and she's everywhere. Everywhere I go now, I see her. <laughs> Every freaking where I go, and like when I see that, I start to by the to seventh time I've seen you, and I'm going, I recognize that that's legit. When I see that, if that person came to me, I go, what can I do for you? Anything you want, because that person is going to go hustle. And when we first did our first ever swap for craft cannery, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, I remember the strength was all of our salespeople are free, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because the brand owners go out and sell their products, so we don't have we don't have to employ salespeople; they're just free. Yeah, so. I, we good? Anything else? Last one? We have, we have last one or, or we can one more. one more question. You're still busy with the yeah. Okay. I'm supposed to go 10 minutes. I went 45. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alright, so next up is Oosh with Chula. Thank you, Dustin. Hello, everyone. I'm Oosh and I'm here with my wife. And thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, let's start to it. Um, I'm Uj. Um, she came to this country as an undocumented in 2014, on August 15, 2014. And very next day, I started working as a dishwasher. That's where I exposed to the first time in my life frozen omelet that's been heated and served to a customer. And in my mind, what the heck? <laughs> and that question, the genuine question in my heart was like, will I serve this to my kid? Will I serve this to my wife? Will I serve this to the people I really care? So that from that's where my curiosity to understand American food system began, right? The journey from there, dishwasher now, uh, my wife and I, we own a grocery store and a restaurant cafe in Utica, New York. So, so far we've been trying to fall in love with this food problem, right? And trying to understand how complicated it is. And now I'm a graduate student at Harvard studying policy and business. And I'm seeing this from an academic perspective. It's not individual, community, reasonable problem. It's a systemic problem. And that's where 
we were okay, we got to do something, right? Because one day we want to turn back and say, we did something to better the community that have accepted, accepted us as we are. So that's where true love began. So we don't like, let me run through the, so that's where the true love is. So true love basically is, is a platform, it's a digital platform. So the, the mission is how we fight, how we can contribute to boost local food sovereignty how we can boost local economics, how we can mitigate climate change, how we can cut down food waste, and on the top of everything, how we can build community, right? And that's where, with that mission, how we can build inclusive, local, sustainable food system. That was the vision we had, because we were keep falling in love with the problem that our food system is broken. And we cannot fix everything, but we try to make some positive changes. So, I mean, talking about the problem, we know, like, we should, if you look at the problem, look at the, look at the data, 92% of the adults and kids we process, we eat ultra-processed food, a billion dollar of food waste, climate change effect, and food security because we rely too much on outside food. So what we did, what we did to tackle this problem, we built a platform. So we built a platform two months ago and launched it in Utica. That's where we're running a pilot project right now. So this, we call it Chula. Chula means kitchen in Nepali, uh, Hindi, a couple of other languages. So what we did, first thing we did to tackle the problem was we built an app so this, this, is, this is an app where we're trying to connect local farmer, local cooks, and a local consumer on the same platform. So this is, so far, we have, we have restaurant, restaurant to consumer, we have individual to consumer, uh, uh, individual cook to consumer, right? So now we were like, you know what? We need to, if we try to make positive change, in our community, we need to bring these three stakeholders on the same platform and let them talk. So our goal was initial goal is like, let them communicate because right now these are in three separate bubbles and then big guys are taking advantage of all these like communication gaps. So we're trying to bring these three stakeholders on the same platform. So what we did was it's a commission free app. We launched it two months ago. Uh, we have around 400 users, uh, restaurant and co individual cooks, and a couple of farmers on that. So we, it's a commission-free, um, unlike DoorDash, Uber charges 30% commission, we are 0%. And then what we did different was, it's a per personal connection. Instead of a restaurant, like our restaurant is called Muju, instead of saying Muju, people see my face because it's more the relational, we, because we want to build community. Um, so it's flexible, so on a DoorDash, Uber Eats, like that, uh, delivery app, people can, cook can only list single orders, but on our app, people can list single order, catering services, and also meal plan. And we're trying to, you know, so, so the time cuts, but what we're trying to do is, no kitchen, don't take a loan. So a lot of immigrants, what happened is like, a couple, couple of people tell them, hey, you got a great food, man, you got to start a restaurant. And next thing they know, they take a loan, nobody's walking in. Right, so we were like, yeah, hold on. You got the really good food, but why don't you use free app to build a traction? And you have something to show that your restaurant is gonna run. You know, you're not going to be in debt after two years. So that's our app part. So, so let me briefly talk about how, how it's going to be sustainable. So the app has a tokenization. So we we'll build our own tokens. So transaction happens in tokens. <coughs> we realize it has to be very secure. 
and we wanted to save processing fee that is going up every single year for our local cook and restaurant because I run the restaurant business so I know so now it's almost four or five percent on our credit card so we were like you know what we'll build our own token system to process our own payment so we both we already build a token every transaction now happens on our app happens on a tokenization so it's in terms of security it changes the whole language system to secure like we save the processing fee let me talk briefly about my my team um, so i'm right there handsome looking guy uh, my co-founder is ioc who is a <coughs> who is a step, full stack developer for uh, over 10 years so she's on the board with me uh, and my roommate uh, in Boston and, uh, is a math, uh, financial mathematician, he's a PhD candidate at a Boston University right now. And uh, Dr. Boris is my classmate, uh, so he's an economist, who, he has, uh, he's from West Africa, and he has just raised over 25 million for his mentor in West Africa. And I'm so grateful for uh, Dr. Bell, he's a MIT climate scientist, uh, to be on the team as a mentor. And, that's the first thing we're doing to tackle the problem. Second thing we're doing is, this is the second thing we're doing, is we're bringing refugee grandmother, refugee immigrant knowledge and connecting them with our local farmer. So the first thing we're doing is app, digital platform. Second thing we're doing is connecting refugee and grandmothers, uh, immigrant grandmothers with the local farmers to bring products and tap into untapped market. For example, right now we are working with the two uh, two products. I'm sorry, I'm pointing out the <laughs> <laughs> so we're working with the we are we are so one so one first one is he he is a some Nepali refugee mothers are working with the local Amish farmer to bring this ghee, and it's already available in our store in New York, New York. And we are working to grow nettle grass. Nettle grass is everywhere in Amish New York. And our grandmother, immigrant refugee grandmother, has an idea how to turn it into food, how to turn it into tea, which is a happy source of vitamin, right? And it's projected to be a hundred and ten million dollar business in the U.S. Right. So that's the two things we're doing uh, from our side to work. Yes, of course we need money. That's the reason we're here. <laughs> um, so yes, we do. So right now we are we are in the we are in the valley of death. Uh, as a founder, I can say that we are in the valley of death. Um, we haven't even got to the place where we can say, hey, let's just start Series A. So we are still in the Valley of it, and we need people like Dustin and like yourself to send us a suggestion. Like, man, you could you could do this way, you could do that. Send us the resources, and we definitely be coming to you as well. You know, as we work with the more immigrant adults, because we have other products in mind, like vegan, uh, like vegan salami, something like that. So, you know, those kind of products. But, yes, yeah, so, and it's a West Coast, so we are trying to keep our numbers very conservative. We are not a, oh, sorry, we are East Coast, so we are trying to do our number conservatively. Uh, so, but so far, so, but the, the market we're trying to do is project to do be 68.6 billion dollar. Uh, so that's where we are, and we need your support, we need your suggestion, we need your mentorship. We're in Upstate New York. Coming back to the coming back to the why is we are not a business, right? We're trying to. It's a movement. We're trying to create an ecosystem that needs all of us to work together. Right? Money comes, right? It's we need it. But I want to be able to tell my kid one day. The food you're eating is not coming from Walmart, it's coming from the farm. A real person grew that farm. Payment grew that. So that's, that's the thing we want to see. 
thank you for your time and thank you, Justin. Sorry, like I was just <laughs> So feedback, uh, so people aren't happy, but at the same time, what I learned, I'm learning still. Uh, so whenever I talk about the local food, people always, people, especially founders, they're always like, how do you do this big supply chain figure out? But when I go to people, it's not about the supply chain. It's about, so let me, before we answer that question, right? we purposely put our uh, office apartment in the middle of the hood because we wanted to be there so when I talk to people they do they are not informed that only this kind of food exists and that's a reaction and that's what I'm learning so that I'm just trying to give you an idea like you know people are like oh is this a thing or they thought Am I supposed to? Uh, they thought the food means only frozen food from the convenience store that they can buy with your food stamp. And I'm still in talk with a. As a matter of fact, tomorrow I'm visiting a farm, uh, like so. I'm gonna pitch it to them to ask them to come to the board. So what, what I meant to say is like there. It seems like there is not much information to the people saying that they could have access to the fresh food, locally grown food. Farmer market is not a suburb thing. It's not limited to one race. You don't have to be rich to go to farmer's market to eat fresh meal. So that's kind of thing I'm learning. So that's a reaction I have. Are you like validating that things are the people on the app but do they get to go through any sort of Validation that food's locally sourced. Is there anything like that? It's kind of validating too, but like, but at the same time, like for me, I tried to, because I said in the beginning, right? I'm still trying to, I'm still falling in love with this problem. So I still spend a lot of time with people and try to see what could be done. Like because when we launched, it was only single order, so it was a people who said. Hey, why don't you add other services? Then we added up. Then we ended up adding catering services, meal plans. So it was all people like I'm getting the feedback. And then, sorry, one more thing I forgot is like we are open not only to kitchens, restaurants, but any individual can sign up and become a cook because we have a certified kitchen. If they get an order, catering order or meal plan, they can come and pack that. So it's, it's open to anything. That's cool. That's cool. So I'm sorry for a long time. <laughs> we can ask one more. Uh, well, can I ask two questions? Or just take one? You can. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that was one. Uh, <laughs> 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 and I'm not telling you I have an answer. You know? uh, so I guess the question one is like, what type of strategic partners would you be working with, like policy makers or maybe like say local masses and you, you know, people, community and communities will find out. Like what type of partnerships would you be needing? And then question two, for like special ingredients, like I have no idea who makes data in most of your work, but like for special ingredients, what do you, you know, what sort of approaches are you taking uh, that would be useful for these communities? Right. So, Thank you. Uh, the first, first thing we're, that helps a lot is my wife and I, we own a grocery store restaurant, so we already have that connection. So it's easy for me to stand by the counter and pitch to everyone or give like forcefully put their like our flyers in their bag, you know. But seriously though, we are working with the nonprofits. Okay. Because I really believe nonprofits should exist to not help in a worse, but should help with building equity. So 
so we we push on that point working with the nonprofit and like hey if you have anyone you can inform what we're doing so we can work together to build the equity so like grassroots yeah so i go and then we do storytelling in our grocery store, which is unheard of, but like, you know, we close this grocery store, we bring people and we do storytelling. Mm -hmm. And then another thing is like, of course, everything doesn't grow in our city yield, right? But what we say is, even if a restaurant ended up using the red eggs uh -huh. from our Amish farm, sure. chicken from our Amish farm or local farm, that's still a win. So that's that's the perspective I have right now. Instead of like let's like hundred percent growth, let's at least can we start making initiative and like start pushing that direction? You know, like of course never grass by the water everywhere. It's free, you know. I mean we need permission, but like it's just that. So but you know, so that's that's my thought. I'm not like hundred percent on pushing like you know it has to be hundred percent growth. Makes sense. I mean we sell Nepali food, you know, so we have to get some spices. <laughs> so, right, so. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So for those of you that did not, if you are a cabbage fan at all, please try it. Please try it. So my name is Mercedes Wilson, and I am the CEO and founder of Sadie's Relish. And I will can't point. So I'm going to be all oh, happy. All right, you said where do you go? You said swipe from right? Space bar. Oh, there we go. So who is Sadie? I am a wife and a mother of four. I am Grace's granddaughter. Grace is a beautiful woman you see at the top standing in between my father and my late grandfather. Grace fed the community. She cooked. I, I was the kid that sat on her lap and ate breakfast with her, watched her wash the dishes while she started dinner. Grace cared about the community. She fed everybody. Um, we knew where to go when we were hungry. I'm a community leader. 2012, I was diagnosed, I'm sorry, 2011, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. 2012, started a nonprofit organization that teaches young women how to advocate for their health and wellness. I realized how much I didn't know about my own health and wanted to take action to help other young people. I'm a television personality and producer and content creator. I want so bad to point at the bottom picture, but you guys see it. <laughs> um, I do food segments for our local ABC affiliate in Buffalo. Um, called Recipes for Seven Life, and I invite people in the kitchen with me to cook recipes that have a story behind it, that are delicious, that the community can grab a hold of, and hopefully cook with their friends and family. So the products that we offer that are out there, we have a mild and a hot relish, um, and it's cabbage-based. It, cabbage is the main ingredient, although there's peppers, onions, other ingredients, vinegar-based. Um, this relish is <coughs> It's good, folks. It goes good in or on things. And we are also coming out with some pickled jalapenos. That is, that is on deck. We are working on that now. Um, as you see, Sadie's is NWBE certified. We are in Erie County, and we are working on federal. So that is coming. Market opportunity. The condiment business in the US is an $85 billion market. The number of food and beverage retail stores in the US is 154,000. I love this number. New York is the second largest producer of cabbage. It produces 14.7% of the United States' total production of cabbage. I mean, I love that. I love that because that's right here. That's us, right? That's us. And working with regional farmers for all the vegetables in this jar is our goal. So on top of cabbage, there's red pepper, orange pepper, Nobody has a pen and paper, right? Let me write down the rest. <laughs> there's red, orange, yellow pepper. There's sweet onion. There's jalapeno. I mean, there, there's other vegetables, but the goal is to have them all. 
I mean, all of it represented in New York. And also the demographics. So we've done, through customer discovery, tons of demos, talking to hundreds of customers. We know what our demographic looks like. She's employed, female between the ages of 35 and 55. She's married or in a relationship. She has children for the most part. Influencer of the household. She cooks for the household. Income between 37 and 70,000. Now that part I really love because um, in Buffalo, we had, most of you know about the, the, the mass shooting that happened at Tops. Jefferson is our number one store. Jefferson is our number one store. And it goes from all across Western New York, but we have support from everyone. I love that. So problem and solution. Problem, flavor, fast food. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten a nutritious meal from McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so void of, Fast food, void of nutrition. We're busy people. We are busy, busy, busy. And lack of food transparency. 72% of people care about what's in their food. This customer cares about it. So the solution, flavor with a touch of nostalgia. Again, that age range is 35 to 55. So nostalgia means a little bit too. Gut health, no preservatives. There are zero preservatives in this. The only thing keeping this is the vinegar. There are zero preservatives. It's a fast growing market projected to grow from 85 billion to, in 2022 to 135 billion by 2030. And on every jar, if you want to grab your phone on the way out, scan that QR code, food transparency is important to us. Right now you will see what country each vegetable comes from. At some point we are going to whittle that down to the farm. Food transparency matters. Current team, it's myself. And then we have Chelsea, who's part-time operations manager. We have Affinity Group, who's our sales broker for the Northeast, River Valley Distribution, PSP Raw, our online shipping partner, and Fresh Fruit Up, who is currently our co-packer, but Paul and I are going to talk to. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Strategic advisors, these are so important. Now there's more than this, but I just listed a few. Bill Chida, who's the president at Affinity Group, a, a broker firm. Zachary Snyder, he knows the food business and marketing. Uh, Peter, UB Culture Bayer Buffalo, and then Olivia, who's a part of the, uh, she's the CEO of Upstate Venture Connect. Partners and collaborations, I am so proud of this. So we are currently in Tops, Market 32, our price chopper, Wegmans, and several other grocery stores. So Taste of Buffalo, we are the relish at the Tops tent. Taste of Syracuse, we are the relish, and I'm pointing, sorry, Paul. Um, the Buffalo Bills games, if you were in any club suites this season, you saw Sabres. Mm -hmm. If you went to a Sabres game and you were in a club suite, you saw Sabres. So, super excited about that. Um, Salins, we just did a cool promo with them, and you'll see some really cool stuff, um, partnerships, promotions coming up with them this summer. And then, of course, Top Seeds, Sabres look really good. Competition, I like this one. Um, so Sadie's, I, I found five or six other competitors. Um, as you can see, we check all the boxes. Could have done that on purpose, could have not. Um, but we're in grocers, we're online. We are very competitive as far as pricing, very competitive, no additives. The food transparency piece is big. Now, if you go to some of the websites, they say made on a local farm. But again, breaking down every vegetable where it's coming from, we are gonna whittle that down to the farm. And then MWB certified. Where are we in time? Three minutes, okay. Distribution, <clears throat> currently in 135 stores, including all of the places that um, I told you about. And then coming soon, we're in Giant Eagle. This summer we're currently talking with Giant Eagle, so we're in Pittsburgh. Retail price, I just wanted to break this down to show you our margins, 38%, $6.99 to $7.49, depending on what the stores charge, wholesale um, cost per jar, 208 profit per jar. This, um, showing you the stores, 2022, we were in 80 stores, 900 cases sold, uh, 2023, 100 stores, 764, 2024 projection. And then I'm gonna convert that to show you what that means in dollars. I did not go from 50,000 to 5 million, 500 million. <laughs> but that 784,000 is only 500 stores. And if anyone knows anything about grocery stores, a lot of times they come in clusters. 
So it can easily go from 500 to 1,000, depending on the chain. Capital budget, 300,000 for the next stage of growth, 18 month runway, and then in year one, we wanna hire, we need help. Operations partner, food tech. If there's nothing else that Sadie's will do, it will, we will remain transparent and the food will keep its integrity. Um, no ads. Sales reps to work along with our brokers and then contractors. Demo, 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 demo. If they try it, they buy it. If they try it, they buy it. You have to get it into the mouth of customers. Key marketing. I love marketing. I'm in TV. Brand awareness, demos, geo-targeting, earned press, food shows. Love food shows. Social media and collaborations. Collaborations make the world go round. If you think you are a small business and you will make it by yourself, you are wrong. Um, and then giving back. Last year, we gave 150 cases to Feed Mart. We believe that financials, it, it, it should not be a reason why someone can't have savings, so we always look to give back. Customer testimonies. I love the last one. Literally obsessed with savings. I ate a jar a week <laughs> and had, had to get another. Okay, I bought two more. I'm putting it on everything, but I am also happy to just eat it out of the jar with a spoon. That is the best way, in my opinion. And then exit strategy, we want to do it with integrity. Five-year plan, mid-size, B Corp certified uh, company acquisition that will uphold values and keep the comp and keep economics flowing in New York. It's important to us that the, that the money stays here. And then contact, how to do it. Perfect. Yeah. Q&A? <laughs> <laughs> So with brands like this, and you're obviously going into grocery retail, right? Why not a more aggressive approach? When you say more aggressive, what do you? Mean? Kroger's, I didn't see the word Kroger's, um, Home 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 Sins, and, um, Walmart, you know, any of the big retailers. The honest answer is not everybody's a good fit. Some stores that you can try to go in, I would be losing money. Um, to have it in, so thus the Walmarts. I mean, I'd be losing money per jar. It just wouldn't be smart at this point, unless you had an awesome co you know. Um, but um, we are we are going after those. We are going after those. So being being new, a lot of it is proving yourself. A lot of it is show. A lot of it is sales. It's, it's developing relationships. It's having. Do you know someone in Albertson? I was going to say, if you know someone. Um, but no, I work with a broker, and, and those are places that we are pursuing. So those are to come. Well, awesome presentation. Again, we'll see more. Um, piggybacking off what Ed asked, actually, is um, in addition to like, larger stores, we did some diversification, like any ideas of maybe increasing like food service relationships that you have online, different options, just to make sure that you're just nimble, because you're not always dependent on like big stores. Like that. <laughs> yeah. We are online, yeah. um, and that is a part of the budget for ramping that up. So we are online. That's a, that's a great one. Thank you for that. What's the shelf life of the product, and do you have other products in the wings ready to hit the market and go to the same customer that are buying your relish now? Shelf life is two years, um, but with the vinegar, I was told by Cornell that it can be forever. Um, but but we put two years. Like, would you buy something that said never expires? I wouldn't. So we put uh, two years. And your second question? What's your next line? Oh, product? So yes. I'll follow up on this one. I'm actually going to pick up our sample from our co-packer tomorrow of the next line. So when I submitted the relishes to Cornell, I actually sent in four things that we have approved waiting. Um, so tomorrow I'll be going to pick up our pickled jalapenos. So that's what's coming next. Are you in the are you in the kimchi line now? Are you a fermented food? Are you technically yes. a fermented yes, food? Yes, it is. That kind of opens up a whole other market yes. as well. Outside of New York and going into Pittsburgh, do you have other geographies that you're looking at based on keeping everything local and at least that looks like in terms of transportation? To be honest, I'd like to grow more in New York as well. Um, bloom where I'm planted. Um, there's there's so many more spots that we can hit in New York, um, Pittsburgh, Ohio. Um, but that's that's our immediate. Yeah. 
what's determining pricing like for an item like this? Are you trying to be the cheapest, or do you want to be most expensive on the shelf? I know you're trying to target customer in the beginning. Yeah. Just trying to match every other rush and other advantages. With this product, um, we are pretty much on par with the others, and a lot of the others are more expensive, just because it, there's, there's so many different ingredients in it. If it were just cabbage, it could be way lower. But the thing about the relish, have you tried it yet? I haven't tried it. I haven't tried it. Oh, you gotta try it. Because you'll see, it goes, it goes good in or on. So it's not just a condiment, I call it an accoutrement. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if you're having a barbecue, you can put it on your hot dogs or your brats. If you're entertaining, you can put it on your charcuterie board. If you're making spaghetti sauce, you can throw it in your sauce. So it's in or on, and it has eight different ingredients in it, so the pricing will always be a little higher. Thus, why the, the slide you saw with the competitors, everybody's there because there's so many ingredients. Did I answer your question? Yeah, something kind of cost-based pricing, rather than quality-based pricing. Yeah. You got time for one more? Uh, I was just gonna add that comment. But when it comes to pricing, like you could consider like if you're differentiated, you could command a higher price. So like as you your brand established, you don't have to worry about the lowest, I guess. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Mercedes, you might have mentioned this before, but as you were getting the company up and running, what kind of resources in New York did you utilize? You mentioned you brought four products to Cornell. Was Cornell um, Karen, like who are the key players that helped you get this product out? Um, I bother the folks at Cornell a lot. <laughs> 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 I took my acidified um, foods course there, okay. um, and all of my products there. I'm, I'm actually, when I pick up the jalapeno, I'm mailing them out okay. to Cornell tomorrow. Um, I had mentors in the, in the food space in different areas, like the broker. Uh, company that I go through, so I have different mentors, but I did um, own the folks at Cornell quite a bit. Yeah. All right. that don't advance 
Um, and we find that to be very helpful to those that come back and try again. Um, and I know the mentors have uh, advised teams that, you know, if, if they have a drive and they've looked at the uh, application or filled it out for the first time, got some feedback, it only helps to kind of finesse it and modify it and, and try again. Can I make a comment? The winner our year was somebody who the previous year had not won. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, off Pro Agony came uh, back their second yeah. year and got the million. The other thing I wanted to say is people always, I get this question a lot. I don't know if you get it that often, but they, they think it's a reimbursable grant. It's not. It's not a reimbursable thing. You don't spend it and then they give it back to you, which is really cool because most of the time grants are reimbursable. Yeah, this isn't a grant or a loan or a gift or a cash prize. It's an equity investment structured in that way through a safe or a warrant and the winning teams have those op an option between those. And those actual agreements are linked on our website too for reference and they aren't negotiable in a way that they're gonna change. So it is for reference uh, resource to look at before you apply to. All right. Sarah, you'll be sticking around for a little bit. If you'd yeah. like that, founders, we all be here for a couple minutes. We will talk to you. Right? This order from the bells. I got to go. Make sure you put some tea in the bells.